Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. We are so excited to be here and to see you all and to answer all of your music theory questions. I hope that you came with lots of questions. Um, we are trying out something new and something techy. And so if you can let me know, really, I'm just going to test something out really quickly. Can you let me know if you can see green that says music theory Q&A with Stephanie and Ashley? Let's see. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, we were trying to do something really cool where we could share our screen with you, but we did not figure out. So we will answer your questions on the fly with our visual old school props, um, as opposed to sharing our screen with you. And we will share our slides if you request them. We actually created this incredible slideshow of every music theory question imaginable. So please, email or send a message in this chat here and we will send you all of the PowerPoints because you're not going to want to miss miss out on these. Yes. So we're going to go ahead and start by answering some questions. And we're also at the end of this live stream going to be giving away our two free memberships. Woo! Yes. Some of you know, <laughs> and if you don't know, Stephanie and I um, we have a business together called The Connection Experiment, and we give concerts, and we teach live courses, and we also have a monthly membership where you get access to our pre-recorded courses, and we are constantly putting up new content. We have a Facebook group that's private that you get to join when you join that membership so you can get all of your questions answered, and you also get our private email address so that you can submit videos and request feedback and all of that good stuff. So... At the end of the live stream, we'll be giving away two three-month memberships, and we already did our drawing, and we know who won, so we're really excited to share that with you here at the end. Now, while you all think of your theory questions, I actually had someone write in a couple of questions to get us started. So I'm going to read some questions that were already um, commented on or commented to me for a while, and then I will... Um, and then we can answer your question. So someone says it's very laggy. Is that true for everybody? Is it really laggy for all of you? Okay, let me see. Um, if I do this, let me just check one more time. Can you see my pink screen? Okay, it's working well for some people. All right, well, then we'll just go ahead and carry on. And I'm so sorry for those of you that are experiencing some issues. I'm gonna clear up some of my internet stuff that's happening here. All right, so the first question is, um, can we please explain the relationship between the pentatonic scale and the formation of chords? So this is a really, really great question. And for those of you that don't know, a pentatonic scale is a five note scale. And the five note scale is the first five notes of the major scale. And so before we dive in and I explain how to build chords and, you know, what all of that's about, it's important that you know the difference between a half step and a whole step. So on the piano, a half step is from one key to the very next key and a whole step is two half steps. So I don't have a beautiful visual up here, but I can kind of show you my piano. If you were to go from C to C sharp, and I know that's backwards for you all, that is a half step, okay? From C to C sharp is a half step, whereas from C to D is a whole step. So one key to the very next key is a half step, two half steps are a whole step. Now a pentascale follows a pattern, and I'm gonna type the pattern into the chat so that you remember it's a whole step, whole step, half step, whole step. So when I build a pentatonic scale, let's say I start on C and I go up a whole step to D, up a whole step to E, up a half step to F, up a whole step to G, and that's my C major pentatonic scale. It's the first five notes of the full major scale. Now, in order to build a chord from that pentatonic scale, that's the really cool thing about pentatonic scales is that you can build chords from any pentatonic scale. I take the bottom note, the middle note, and the top note and play them all three at the same time and that builds a chord. So if the pentatonic scale is major, your chord is gonna be major. If the pentatonic scale is minor, your chord is gonna be minor. Anything to add, Stephanie? 
Yeah. So I have heard the word pentatonic used in a couple different ways. One is the way that Ashley was talking about, and the other was a way that people often use to improvise. So I'll go ahead and show you the pentatonic scale is penta means five. So if you can see the piano here, I'm going to play right up here. A pentatonic scale is the one, two, three, five, and six of any major scale. So Penta means five and tonic is of the key. So sometimes people will call pentatonic scales the five finger scales that we play on the piano. And sometimes when improvising, people use the pentatonic scale, which is a five note scale, penta meaning five and tonic again, starting on the tonic of the key, but you're skipping over that fourth note. And this pentatonic scale is often used to improvise as well as you hear it a lot in imp impressionistic music as well. So uh, Ashley was talking about one version of a pentatonic scale, and I also wanted to hit you guys with another version of the pentatonic scale, which is super fun to improvise with, and it makes you sound like you know what you're playing, even if you don't, like me sometimes a lot of the time. Like if I'm in <laughs> C, I know I can play the one, two, three, five, and six of any key. And it's going to sound kind of cool. So that's how I would explain the pentatonic scale. Nice. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> okay. So another question, and I might actually uh, give you this question to start if you'd sure. like to. So what is the importance and the use of the chromatic scale? Does it have any relation to harmony similar to the other scales and their harmonic field? Do we have to include it in our practice routine? That's a really good question. Um, if you don't have thoughts on it, I'll share or you can start. Yeah, so that was a loaded question <laughs> um, because matter of opinion, obviously, but the chromatic scale is hugely important in so many ways. I'll come back with the impro improvisational aspect of it. I was hoping you would. <laughs> there are so many different ways that you can improvise with the chromatic scale. And just to show you, you can start on any key and kind of work your way up to a chord tone that you're improvising over. So if you are improvising in the key of C and you're playing with a pentatonic scale and you decide you want to leave home a little bit tonal tonality wise, you can do a chromatic scale and everybody will be like, ooh, that sounded outside of the box because <laughs> anything chromatic sounds cool. Uh, also, I'm sure Ashley has other ideas, but I gotta say, you're gonna see a lot of chromatic scales in your repertoire that you play. So it's hugely important to learn how to play chromatic music. And there's a whole genre entirely written on the chromatic scale. It's called the 12 tone row. And um, I'm, I'll let Ashley rip off of that if she wants to. But basically, it's music that is entirely composed of the 12 tones of a chromatic scale. And if you didn't know, I didn't know this until, like, I think my first quarter of grad school, which is super embarrassing to admit. <laughs> but the 12-tone row is just a chromatic scale from one note to the next. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And people compose music in a funky way using the chromatic scale. So... We could go on for days, but I'm going to zip my lip and let Ashley finish with this whole chromatic <laughs> scale concept. Yeah, I think the chromatic scale is important to practice. It's not, I don't think the theoretical aspect of it is the same as practicing major and minor scales because the chromatic scale isn't going to relate to every single chord that you're playing necessarily. Um, but I do think, like Stephanie said, it's important to know the chromatic scale for improvising. And then also in Western classical repertoire, you will see a lot of chromatic scales, especially in the romantic period where you're doing or the classical period where you're doing a lot of cadenzas things like that a lot of those are going to be based off of the chromatic scale so i would say don't stress out about it but maybe incorporate it into your practice routine a little bit so you're at least familiar with the fingering the nice thing about the chromatic scale is it's pretty well i'm not going to say it's easy to practice but once you do it a few times you start to get the pattern of the fingering and it can become a little more fluid and hopefully it will start to feel easy all right. Now Great I have a question. Yes. Good question. I have a couple more questions. And as we're reading through these, go ahead and type your questions in the chat. You know, we can, we can always scroll back and find the questions. So another one is, um, is there a solution for small hands and chords that can't be reached other than ignoring the highest note? This is a great question. I also have small hands. I struggle to reach chords, especially in music by people like Rachmaninoff, where there's, you know, chords that have five notes in them and things like that. Um, so I think as opposed to leaving off 
the highest note, you want to think about maybe leaving out a note that is doubled in the harmony. So for example, if you're rolling a chord in the right hand and that chord has an E and the left hand also has an E, you would maybe want to eliminate the E from the right hand to make it a little bit easier since you're already playing an E with the left hand. That's an option. The other option is to make sure um, that you still have the voicing of the chord and the melody. So oftentimes, I would say almost always when we're playing chords, there is a melody somewhere in the chord and it's often on that top note. So I wouldn't recommend leaving out the top note every time. I would recommend, you know, taking it as a case by case basis um, and seeing if you can figure out which note you can eliminate in the sneakiest way. And then the other thing you can do in, in romantic era repertoire is you can consider rolling some of the chords. That's not always artistically appropriate. It is in some instances more than other, but that's an option. Um, if you can't reach all of the notes in a blocked way, you can always consider rolling the chords so that you can reach them easier. Anything to add? You covered it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Just don't, don't hesitate to omit certain notes because you don't want to hurt your hand, especially if you have a smaller hand. And I think if you were trying to decide what note to omit, and maybe Ashley already talked about this, but just prioritize the melody note and then take out the secondary notes that maybe don't matter as much to the overall piece. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so the next question is about ear training. Um, what is the best way to learn how to recognize intervals um, by ear? There's someone on YouTube that says it's very useless to train intervals and it is very, very difficult. And I'm gonna lump this second question in with that because it's similar. How do you learn and recognize chords by ear? These are great questions. And I think that the answer will vary depending on who you ask and probably different musicians will have different opinions. Um, I always take a holistic approach in my music education. And so I think that if we can be exposed to not only playing the instrument, but the music history and the music theory and ear training and all of the stuff that goes along with it, it's gonna make you a stronger musician the more that you know, right? The more you know. Um, and so with ear training, I do incorporate it with my students because training our ear isn't necessarily just about learning how to recognize intervals or learning how to recognize chords. It's learning how to listen with this idea of active listening. And in order to practice and evaluate how we're sounding and what we might want to change or what we might, we might want to do differently, we need to be able to actively listen. So ear training at the most basic form is really just learning how to listen and how to tune in to the sound that you're producing at the instrument. Now, do you have anything to add to that? No. Okay. That's great. Okay. As far as learning intervals, um, I think it really depends on what your goals are with music. It's not something that I ever learned growing up. It's not something I learned until I was a music major in college. And once I did learn it, it's wildly useful. Um, it's very, very useful to be able to recognize the intervals, especially if you're listening to other people play like we do all the time and you need to be able to tell if they're playing things correctly or, you know, if they're following the music or not. It's very helpful to be able to hear intervals. Um, it's also really helpful to train bait your, I would say, for improvising yes. and for being able to know in your own music, are you playing correctly or are you playing incorrectly? If I look at a piece of music and I see a pattern of intervals, and I know what those intervals sound like, I have a context for what those intervals sound like, I'm much more likely to know if I make a mistake or not than if I'm just looking at notes on the page and I don't have any context of what they sound like in relation to each other. So I guess, I know that's a complicated answer, but I would say ear training is really, really, really important. Do you need to go so far as to learn every single interval on the piano by ear? Maybe that can be a long-term goal if you really want to do a lot with music, but you should at least be able to hear the diff differences between like steps and skips and larger intervals and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do you think? Do you teach your students ear training? Yeah, I try to. And I think that it also, it's just empowering to know what you're hearing in music. And when I can identify an interval, like say Star Wars, Star Wars, the intro to Star Wars is a perfect fifth, right? And that is something that I teach my students all the time to hear perfect intervals and attach it to something that they know. And if you can hear it in your mind, then you can sing it too. And if you can sing it, then you can create it. And if you can create it, you can improvise with it. And so listening is a huge part of improvising. Um, hearing intervals and hearing chords is a huge part of writing music, if that's something that you dream of doing someday. Um, everything feeds into each other. So there is only two things to be gained from learning how to hear what you're playing. 
And just to drive that point home, think about learning a language, right? If we didn't listen to a language we were trying to learn, we wouldn't be able to speak with the correct accent or understand what we were saying, right? Correct. And so I think that's another way to think about it too. We need to be able to hear what we're doing. You don't have to be an expert, but just dabble and see, hey, I'm going to use these tricks to hear intervals. Mm -hmm. And from there you can grow. Yeah. So it never hurts. Never hurts. It's not going to hurt you. Um, And I would say for learning how to do ear training or for practicing ear training in your own routine, there's a really great website called Teoria. And I'll put that in the description of the video. Um, That's a great website. They have, you can kind of build your own ear training exercises. So you can start really basic with just, you know, little simple intervals small intervals, you can do a couple at a time. And then you can work towards being able to hear the differences between the chords and things like that. Um, As far as hearing the differences between types of chords, like major, minor, augmented, diminished, seventh chords, I'm guessing is maybe what that question was. Um, Practicing with a website like Tiora would be helpful. Also practicing those chords in your own practice and I don't know if you'll like this answer, but singing along with the notes of the chord. So breaking the chord into individual notes so you can really internalize and hear and kind of feel the sound of the chord. That can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, What's another good way to practice learning to recognize different chords? Honestly, I think singing is the best way. Um, I think like watching that website, um, Teoria. Mm -hmm. Looking at like, I'd also maybe recommend looking up some of your favorite pop or rock songs. Um, something that you're really familiar with and say, oh, House of the Rising Sun, that starts with an A minor chord. Okay, that's what a minor chord sounds like. Um, And kind of attaching it to something that you already know because music isn't foreign to any of us, right? We've been listening to music since the day we were born, most likely. And um, we know so much more than we think we do. So if we can attach it to something we've heard several times by, say, choosing a song you've heard many, many times and looking up the lead sheet, then you can start saying, oh, okay, that's an A minor chord. Yeah. So yeah, but it's a great question. And I think people are starting to ask questions in the chat, which makes (laughs) us so happy. So let's hit with those. By the way, we're so excited you're all here with us tonight. This is just so much fun. And Um, I did just throw that, I didn't throw the link, but it's Teoria is the name of it. So you should be able to see it in the chat now. Um, Yes, I think attaching it to something you already know is amazing and also attaching it to what you're currently learning. So go through your piece, analyze the chords, and then, you know, that can be a part of your practice routine as well. Okay, let's see. If you're a beginner with music theory, where do you recommend starting? Woo, good question. So if you're a total beginner, like you don't know anything about music, I would recommend getting a book, honestly, or watching some videos either on YouTube or something like that. But a book will be nice because it's going to take you in uh, a progressive way that makes sense where concepts build on top of each other. With music theory, kind of like with learning a language, it's going to be pretty difficult if you're just learning random words or random mm-hmm. phrases. You can do it that way. It, that, there's nothing against doing it that way. But it can also be really helpful to learn the alphabet and then learn a couple of small words and then to learn a couple of simple sentences and then learn how to speak fluently. And the same is true of music theory. So um, my favorite music theory books are Keith Snell and Mar- Martha Ashley. Um, they look like this and I'll link these in the description as well. They start at the preparatory level and they go all the way through level 10. And it's great because each book is split into units. Um, you know, the first unit would be like your basic rhythm, uh, or your basic note values and rest values, which I also have a video on. If you, I can link that in the chat and maybe how to read music on the staff. That would be a really great place to start. And I'll link that video in the chat. As, or I'm sorry, in the description as well. Um, those are kind of the basics of how you get started and then everything else builds from there. Yeah. Right, I agree. Okay, cool. Do you recommend recording yourself? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Two thumbs up. And I'd be curious who asked that question, um, Tech Mac. Um, I'd love to hear in what way are you recording yourself? Are you recording yourself practicing? Are you recording yourself singing? Um, yeah, just kind of elaborate a little bit more. I'll, we'll go ahead and guess that you're recording yourself practice. And there are so many benefits to be gained, mostly just to know, A, you're creating amazing music. You and an instrument together are creating sound that creates musical sense, which is a beautiful gift. And it's really easy to just sit at the piano and feel frustrated and feel like you aren't making progress. But when you record yourself, you can actually listen back and say, hey, wow, like I was actually able to create something that sounds like music. And I think when we don't step back and look at what we're creating, we don't get to appreciate all the hard work that we're putting in. And that said, it's also very important because 
once we find all the positives, which I cannot emphasize enough, if you're going to record yourself, you need to record yourself with loving kindness towards yourself and loads of self-acceptance. Um, if you're not in a space where you feel like you can offer that to yourself, then maybe wait. Um, the number one thing you should do is, well, shoulds are not helpful, but I'm going <laughs> to go ahead and should y'all. You should write down the things you're doing well, because if you don't notice what you're doing well, it's going to be a lot harder to tackle the things that you're weaker at. So then you can go back after you've realized you need to make a little bit of progress and say, okay, well, I'm really strong at reading notes, but maybe my rhythm needs a little bit more consistency. And that way you can start to analyze, hey, what am I, what am I musically strong at? And what could I stand to improve? This is all really good, right? Because music is a lifelong journey and we're all in this for the long haul. And it's just a great way to take information as information and, and learn from it. Definitely. And I think I encourage my students to record themselves often and I do it as well because it's a really great way for you to hear outside of yourself. So when we're actually producing music or producing sound at the piano, we are so involved with what's going on and we're so involved with the process of making the music. And it requires a lot, as we all know, it requires a lot of brain power. And so sometimes it can be hard to objectively listen to ourselves while we're also trying to create a sound at the same time. So when you record yourself, you have the option, like Stephanie is saying with loving kindness, to, to look back on that recording and to hear it in a way that you're not, that we're, none of us are capable of hearing ourselves in the moment when we're playing music live. So it's a really, really great thing to do. Um, and yes, I highly recommend it. And I, I always challenge my students to start with the positives, like Stephanie was saying. So maybe make a goal for yourself of like, I'm going to say three, three things I did well, and then one thing that I want to work on in my next practice session. Yeah, Agreed. really, really great questions. And it looks like Nick Robertson added to that total beginner. And I sent my two-year-old niece a video of me playing her favorite song and she went bananas, really motivating. That's so sweet. Exactly. You I don't know that. whose lives you're going to touch with your music. And I'm not even being cheesy. I'm being real. So uh, yeah. thank you for sharing, Nick. Yeah. Okay. When you mark up a piece that you're learning, what kinds of marks, reminders, et cetera, do you put? Anything other than note letters and fingering? Oh, that's a really good question. So I'm going to answer first by saying that when I'm going to mark up my music, I will often use colored pencils because I mark up my music a lot. So <laughs> yeah, and I like to be able to see the different colors or the different layers um, because it can get quite messy in my music. So I put a lot of things in there. I will often do finger numbers for sure. That's a really, really, really great thing to do. If you're in the beginning, you can do note names. Um, I will often write my phrase numbers in. And a musical phrase or a phrase in music is like a musical sentence or idea. There are sometimes four or eight measures, but basically a phrase is like a small section of music um, that makes sense. And so I will often number my phrases or break my music up into smaller sections. And that's one of the first things that I do when I'm starting a piece so that for the rest of my learning with that piece, I have sections that I know I can jump around to and practice out of order and drill so that I'm not always starting at the beginning of the piece and playing through it. Because if we always start at the beginning of the piece and just play through from beginning to end, beginning to end, the beginning is going to be really strong and the end is not going to be so strong because by the time you get to the end of the piece, you're a little bit tired, you're exhausted from playing, um, and that, that beginning part is always going to get your good energy. So I will write in the phrase numbers. I will often write in dynamics. So I believe that music is very dramatic and very exciting. And oftentimes the score doesn't have as many dynamic markings as I would like there to be. So artistically, I will decide to put more dynamics in my score. And so I will often write those in with a different color. Um, and then I write, I do a lot of like circling or Xing when I'm practicing. So if I make a mistake on an area or on a measure or on a note more than one time, I circle that or I write a reminder to myself of like what the correct thing is. So if it's a G natural and I keep playing a G sharp, I will circle that spot in my music and I will write G natural so that I can see that as I'm approaching that spot in the music and hopefully not continue to make that same error. So those are some of the things that I write in my music. What about you? All of that. And I also like to write in the chord symbols of music so I can start memorizing the harmonies. I think more conceptually. So thinking about many notes tends to flip me out mentally. So I like to take many ideas and block them into one or two. So for instance, for instance, if I have a passage that is just like, 
you know, an arpeggiated C major chord, which is just C, E, G, right? I'd rather just write a big C in my music and say, okay, well, this is all a C major chord, right? Rather than having to write in C, E, G. Obviously, it takes time to learn what chords are. And so that is something that is a little bit more advanced. But if you're learning your five finger pentascales, you're already to a point where you can build chords, which means you can probably analyze what kind of chords are happening in the music that you're playing. And just a tip, a uh, chord is a series of notes that you play at the same time, like this. So I like to go through in my music when I'm learning it. And in addition to writing in finger numbers and cue notes sometimes, I mean, there's no shame in writing in a note if you habitually miss it. Um, in addition to doing phrase analysis and doing section work, writing in chords, very helpful. And in it, I would also say, Melissa, it might be really helpful if you listened to the piece you're trying to learn and often, because the more you listen to something, the more you're able to internalize it. So if you have a recording of the piece you're listening to, I highly recommend that you listen to it many times and maybe even try to sing with it. Even if you don't consider yourself a singer, being able to, you know, externalize what you're trying to internally play is super helpful. So um, we can talk about that more in class too, because you're in our piano class, which is so <laughs> yes. cool. You are so cool. Um, one other thing, I can't believe I forgot this, rhythm. I will write in the counting, like often, if I would, I'm not always, but often I will write in the counting and the rhythm in my piece because I'm a visual learner. And so if I can see the one and two and three and four and, or whatever the counting and rhythm of the, of the piece is, I'm much more likely to be counting out loud. And I'm much more likely to accurately play that rhythm. It also makes me go through the music and actual, excuse me, actually figure out how to count the piece, which is a really, really, really important step in the beginning. So rhythm, add that to the list as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, circling all the unmarked accidentals, like all the F sharps in the key signature of G. Yes, that's a really, really, really great idea. Do you think this is bad with sight reading? Will it become more intuitive with time? You know, that's a really great question. So talking about like, if you're reading in the key of G, in the key of G, we have F sharps. They're not going to be marked in every single measure. So going through and circling them to make sure that you remember them is a really great idea, especially in the beginning stages. And if you can do that and you can play a couple pieces in the key of G major and then maybe with each piece you know you you start circling less and less and you start to maybe only circle half of the unmarked ones or maybe you only circle the ones on the first page or the first line that would be a good goal and a good way to get yourself to bridge the gap between always having the circle the sharps or flats and then being able to remember them the other thing that's going to help with that is practicing your scales um and so I have some videos about I did a 14 day piano scale challenge and I'll put that in the description, but scales are a really great way to connect the key signatures with, you know, what that feels like with the pattern of sharps and flats and black keys and white keys on the piano. And so whenever you're learning a piece in the beginning stages, like if you're learning a piece that's in the key of G, practice the G major scale as well. And that's going to help you solidify that in the key of G major, there is an F sharp. And so hopefully when you go on to your next piece in the key of G, you can reduce the number of circles or try doing it without the circles um, to get yourself there. What do you think? I, I agree with what you're saying. Okay. And I, I think that as long as it's helping you and it's not turning into a crutch, then then go with it. That yeah. would be, that would be, but yeah, you covered it. Okay, cool. Did you notice a difference in technique in your students that transitioned from a digital to an acoustic? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Really big difference. It's mm -hmm. interesting, but um, it, it's just so hard to capture the weight and feel of an acoustic piano. And yeah. the keyboard just doesn't quite do it. it. It doesn't give you the acoustics. It doesn't give you the natural feel. And generally speaking, I have noticed that students who have a real acoustic piano can develop better technique. Um, over a, a digital. Now, I mean, obviously, if a digital is all you have to work with, that's okay. I just would recommend that you are using an instrument that's weighted so that it can be as much like an acoustic as possible. But, but yeah, it's a bummer that acoustic pianos are not nearly as accessible as right. a digital piano because not everybody has space, money, you know, all that stuff for an acoustic piano. Um, but if you think about the way, you know, the mechanism of how the sound is produced on a piano, it's all about the distribution of weight. How much weight are we dropping into the keys? And that weight really affects the hammer coming up and striking the strings. And so I've noticed the biggest difference between keyboards and acoustic pianos is the development of, um, 
of the technique of using your whole arm yeah. and of, of using your whole body and really being able to respond to the instrument. Um, one thing I would say is that you don't, if you don't have access to an acoustic instrument or you can't have an acoustic instrument personally, there might be a situation where you could get access to one by using one in a public space or using one in a school or a church or something like that. Um, oftentimes there are places if you're, you know, um, not sneaky about it, but if you're if you're a detective and if you really look for it, you might be able to find some opportunities to play on acoustic pianos if that's not something that you can have in, in your in your home. I have played on some really, 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 really good keyboards, but it's true. They just, the way the sound is produced is totally different. So it's never quite the, exactly the same. Um, okay. It's a great question. That's a really great question. So keep asking and I'm going to go on to one of the ones that was submitted before. Um, so this is about the proper position of the fingers. Uh, can we show you how to play with the proper position of the fingers? Your finger, this person is saying their fingers are always glued to the keys and they think this is correct. And they're asking if that produces legato. So that's kind of two separate things ish, um, unless I'm misunderstanding the question. So the way to play at the piano would be to keep your fingers glued. Do you want to show? Sure. Yeah. Can you? Can you tell me more of the question? Again? Oh, yeah. So I think this person is asking, like, we should be keeping our fingers glued to the keys, which is correct. So if you play a couple of notes with your fingers glued to the keys. Yeah. And the, the legato sound comes from playing a note and then holding that note down until you play the next note like this. Now we can still, and we still should keep our fingers glued to the keys, even if we're not playing a legato sound. So if I'm playing my notes detached, meaning there's gonna be space in between each note, my fingers are still gonna stay glued to the keys. They're not gonna be lifting off the keys like this. They'll still stay on the keys, but we'll allow for that space in between each note. Yeah. So I hope that answers that question. Um, so legato and staccato are just different articulations on the piano. Legato is smooth and connected. Staccato is detached. Um, you can also play detached without playing staccato, but both involve keeping your hands or your fingers nice and rounded and glued to the keys. Um, I have a video coming out in the next couple of weeks. I just, I just edited it. Um, and it's about some common piano practice injuries that I see when people come to lessons and they're saying that they have pain um, or, you know, they, they have an injury or something like that. And one of the things that I see that can cause a lot of tension and a lot of pain is unnecessarily like lifting the fingers off of the keys when we don't need to be doing that. And, and that can cause some pain and tension. So we never want to be doing that. So if that's happening, just make sure you really focus on keeping your fingers glued to the keys in this nice rounded, relaxed hand position. Um, and that's going to be it's going to feel a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anything to add? Yeah. Um, well, I think all of that. And then just also noticing if your fingers are chronically being splayed out in any way when you're playing, just to let your arm weight release naturally into your lap and let your body assume like a relaxed, balanced feeling, and then try to bring that to the piano. But the idea is that you don't want to crop up any tension because if you have tension in a finger, then that travels up your whole arm, which makes it more difficult to play faster, more technical passages. So just remembering that when you do play, you do play with your whole arm and you allow gravity and so gravity with your weight drop and acceleration to create that. So um, I think keeping your hands close to the keys is very helpful. Um, you don't have to never move them, obviously, but if you start seeing them chronically splaying in this way, that's a surefire indication that you're creating tension in your upper body, which is going to be really hard to play. So um, sometimes another word for position also is just uh, neutral, like a place of neutral. So um, when I'm trying to teach position, I try to say the neutral hand instead. And um, I'll just kind of quickly demonstrate that. So if you all just want to like drop your hand to your side and let it hang naturally like this, this is called the neutral hand. And you can see how it naturally curves without me efforting. I'm just letting my hand relax here. So if I bring my neutral hand to the piano, it already keeps that nice natural curve that people sometimes say, you know, the bubble or the curve or whatever that can be created simply by dropping your hand to your side and letting your hand relax. 
and that is a neutral position. So when we can play at the neutral position, then it's easier to keep our fingers glued or close to the keys because we're using our body in the way it was built rather than trying to force it into a position. So that's something to play with too. Just like let your whole arm relax, let your hand drop to your side and let it just naturally fall into a curve. Then see if you can bring that natural neutral hand to the piano and play like that. And you'll, I bet if you bring that neutral hand and use your arm weight, you're not going to have to control your fingers nearly as much because your arm is going to be doing what it was built to do, which is kind of cool. So I like the neutral. That makes a lot of sense. Cause yeah, it's just, it's, it's not totally relaxed, but it is this, this feeling of being relaxed in, in that your hand is just neutral. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I like to kind of use that interchangeably. If mm -hmm. it works great, if not, then that's great too. Yeah. All right, we need some more questions. So if you're feeling shy, go ahead and type in the chat. Um, and while you're thinking of your questions, I'm gonna just go ahead and talk to you about one of my favorite uh, music theory subjects. And by favorite, I mean, those of you that have seen my videos know that I chronically for most of my life was like really bad at rhythm. Um, but I think rhythm is really important. And I think it's something that sometimes gets left out of music theory in that we, we think of rhythm as something that we have to do or something that we have to produce at the piano. But I think a lot of people kind of get on this stray path when they don't actually spend the time to study the note values and figure out how they connect um, and fit together in different measures and things like that. And so one of my favorite music theory concepts to focus on with my students is rhythm and counting. And like I mentioned before, if you're going to mark up your music, write in your counting and make sure that you really know, you know, where the beats are and how those notes are fitting together within the measure. It's going to make you a stronger musician. Something that I really like that Stephanie said a couple weeks ago that I stole and I use it all the time now is that rhythm is the skeleton of the piece. You know, if we didn't have a skeleton in our body, we would just be like goop on the floor. <laughs> um, and the same is true of music. If we don't pay attention to rhythm and if we don't understand what the rhythm of a piece is and how it all fits together, we lose that skeleton um, and we lose that, that pulse. And rhythm is innate into all living beings. We have a heartbeat. So we are always subconsciously aware of rhythm because our heart is beating. Um, we hear rhythm in the ocean, in the waves. We hear rhythm all around us. And so even if we don't think that we are that great at rhythm, we can usually tell in a piece of music if something is off or if something doesn't feel right. And oftentimes I find that lots of things come back to rhythm, even if we don't think they come back to rhythm. So that'd be one of my big music theory tips for all of you is to just get even more familiar and even more strong with rhythm. Um, what is, oh yeah, we can just have those. I was gonna ask you, what is your, um, what's like one of your favorite topics of music theory or something that you hear or see as like a weak point in the general piano learning community? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, usually the understanding of key signatures oh. is a big one. Yes. Um, and like majors versus relative minors, mm -hmm. I think. Um, for a really long time, that all mystified me and I didn't understand why isn't there just one key? Like why would you need to write pieces and keys with sharps and flats when you could just play everything in C? <laughs> and, um, and when I started getting more into like, you know, my musical studies and everything, I learned more about key signatures and I just found them really, really fascinating and super fun because when you know your key signatures, then you can build all the chords in the key and you can mix and match different chords from different keys and you can modulate, which means to change keys in a piece. Um, and for those of you that maybe uh, aren't familiar, key signatures just tell you how many sharps or flats are in a piece of music. And, um, and so I love teaching and learning key signatures because I think that it's super helpful to understand how music that's already been written is built. You can look at a piece of music and if you understand key signatures, you'd be able to identify the chords, you'd be able to identify what kind of scales are being used. And then if you decided that you wanted to write your own song, then you could use that as a platform and say, well, okay, they started on the one chord and they ended on the one chord and they played, you know, the four or five and sometimes the six chord in between. So what if I took those chords and put them, transposed them into a different key? How would I like the sound of that? And uh, one of my students who's um, older than me and knows a lot more about improvising than I do, he told me that 
Um, the key of D flat major is the key of the earth. And it's the key that all of animals like whales and wolves and uh, other Whoa. creatures, they like make their, their calls in the key of D flat. That is so Which cool. is super cool. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, cite your sources, but there was a whole <laughs> album written on this concept. And so um, I just, and every key is sort of like that. There's like the key of love yeah. in the Baroque era. And there's just all these different, different composers have different ideas. Yeah, yeah, different ideas. And so like you can take something that's just like, oh, why would I need to know my key signatures? That's so boring. <laughs> and then say, oh my God, like this is actually really cool. And it's connected to other creatures in the world, you know, on our planet. So, that. um, for me, I love learning and pushing myself with key signatures. And I also love pushing myself outside of tonality and saying, wow, like what kind of crazy scales could I use over this chord? I just think it's really fascinating. So if any of you are curious, just start studying your key signatures and start learning them on the piano. And if you're intrigued, then try to identify what key your pieces are in and maybe even try to write something in a key that's less familiar to you. So yeah, that would be kind of my, my two cents, but love it. I'll just say like, first of all, again, I just want to say I'm super grateful to be here. Thank yeah. you for having me. <laughs> and I think it's so exciting how many people have come tonight. And yeah. If, thanks to you all for coming. Yeah. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't have anybody to, to share this information with. So your presence here tonight is like really amazing. And yeah. we're super glad you're here. So okay. we have some questions. Agreed. And thank you for being here. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stephanie's amazing. As you all know, if, if you've seen Stephanie on the channel, you know, she's amazing and I love working with her. So thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Do some people just have bad rhythm? Uh, yeah, me. I would say that was me in the beginning. <laughs> um, but it is possible to learn better rhythm. So a great way to learn better rhythm would be to start at the very beginning and learn some of your note values. So I'm going to go super old school here and I'm going to hold up a flashcard. Um, but knowing, you know, that this is a quarter note and it gets one beat and this is a quarter rest and it gets one beat and this is another quarter note. And we're in a time signature that is three, four. So this is one, two, three. And then to practice clapping and counting that out loud. Um, and I know that was a lot in a little bit of time, but basically in order to strengthen your rhythm, you need to start paying, first paying attention to rhythm. See if you can turn on some music, clap along, find the beat. If you can find a beat, that's awesome. Then you can, you can produce a beat yourself. Um, so getting to know what the note values are and then looking at maybe, maybe simple measures and trying to clap and count them out loud. So we would be clapping when we would be playing. So, you know, you'd clap on the quarter note and then you'd rest during the rest and then you'd clap on the quarter note and doing some clapping and counting out loud is a really great way to strengthen your rhythm because you don't have to think about so many things at once. You can just focus on rhythm. Um, so that can be a really, really, really helpful way to do it. And that's something I do with my students all throughout their piano education is we have parts of their lesson and parts of their weekly practice where they focus just on rhythm because our rhythm skills and the ability to play with a metronome and produce a beat uh, is a skill that needs to be developed just like any other skill, just like the technique of playing the piano, just like the ability to create dynamics on the piano. All of it is, it's all skills you can develop if you practice. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I will take the other opinion of no, we all have rhythm. There's no such thing as bad rhythm. It just, there's different types of rhythm. I mean, and um, there are, there, we all have a heartbeat and we all have blood coursing through our vein, veins. So we have natural rhythm inside of us. Um, sometimes people have a hard time externalizing that rhythm, but that doesn't mean that you have bad rhythm. It means you have different rhythm. Um, so I like what I would recommend, um, it's kind of like different types of learners. Like I'm a learner where I have to be inundated with all different types of information at the same time, like tactile, kinesthetic, aural, visual, like if I don't have all four of these puppies like circulating <laughs> in the same picture, like the information will go in one ear and out the other, like 80% of the time. And I just, I've understood that over the course of my life. And so instead of feeling stupid, I've decided that I'm just a different type of learner because I need to be informationally driven in many types of ways. So it could be possible that potentially you just have a different sense of rhythm. So I read this in a book, um, it's called a soprano on her head. Um, and one of the recommendations she has with her students is to get her students who struggle with externalizing rhythm is to get on the floor and crawl because our innate ability to feel rhythm is demonstrated when we're on the floor crawling our ability to coordinate one hand with our other knee back and forth. 
in many ways is similar to what we're doing with the piano. And it also oftentimes is in rhythm. So it's very rare that you'll see people crawling out of rhythm. People like are able. This. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it's super, it's a natural ability that yeah. we all have. Right. So if you feel yourself, I know it feels kind of silly, but um, I do a lot weirder stuff when I'm trying <laughs> to have a breakthrough. So um, just if you're struggling with the rhythm, just get on the floor and try to crawl in a steady beat and then see if you can crawl a quarter note pulse Then see if you can crawl a half note pulse and then see if you can crawl, I don't know, an eighth note pulse. And then you'll look like the exorcist. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, you know, just kind of get into that awesome sort of beat with your body. And um, and it's amazing the kind of breakthroughs you, you can have. So yeah. um, I just to be the devil's advocate here, um, I want to say that um, there are different types of rhythm. There's no such thing as bad. You convinced me. I love it. <laughs> okay. Um, now we have a lot of questions. So let's see any advice on playing fast, but quietly and piano. I tend to get louder if I play faster, especially if jumping around on the keyboard. Whew, that's a good question. That's really hard to do. Um, I would say the two things that come to mind immediately, and it would obviously greatly depend on the context of what piece you're playing and like how you're jumping and what you're doing. But the first thing I would say is taking something with the metronome at half tempo, playing it at the dynamic that you want to play it at, and then going up by two clicks at a time, which sounds really painful. But once you're in the zone and you're doing it, you can do it fairly quickly. Um, and so you're starting at that really slow half tempo and then keeping the piano dynamic when you move the metronome up two clicks and then keeping the piano dynamic when you move it up two more clicks. And that's going to really help you get the physical aspect of technically playing something at a quiet level. Um, my other suggestion would be to practice whatever it is that you're trying to play quietly and quickly in rhythms. And I'll link my rhythm video below and I have a new rhythm video that's going to be even better coming out. So I'll link that one because um, that's going to help you you know, kind of get that technical aspect of playing quickly and quietly at the same time um, in a really quick way. All right, do you want to take this one? A place where sure. I constantly get stuck is when I try to play both hands after getting fairly comfortable playing a piece with one hand at a time, clapping, counting, et cetera. Any tips? Oh, but I have a good tip for this one. Go for it. Go for you it. You know how I said everything comes back to rhythm? <laughs> this might come back to rhythm. So one of the things with uh, with practicing hands alone and then trying to play something hands together is it's like trying to coordinate two people that learn to dance in separate rooms and then they're coming together and they're just winging it. And so if you're counting out loud when you practice your left hand alone and you're counting out loud when you practice your right hand alone and then you're counting out loud when you put hands together, the counting out loud, that skeleton, is like the common thread that helps you tie both of them together. And if you don't have that common thread, you will not be able to coordinate the hands together. So that's my number one thing. Okay. Yeah, I no, turn the mic over. <laughs> I, I think that's great. I don't really have a ton to add. Um, when you're trying to get hands together, just like tiny chunks, like baby steps here. So if you're just working on uh, getting hands together for the entire piece, consider just trying to get it for one measure five times in a row with a steady beat. Um, and if you can't do a full measure, then do two full beats of that measure. So it can feel extremely discouraging to get hands together. And it's just a matter of your body catching up to what your mind knows how to do. So um, your body oftentimes will learn things a little bit slower than your mind. And you just have to be patient and repetitious. So I would recommend, you know, after patting and counting the rhythm, like Ashley suggested, which is fundamental. The notes don't mean anything if you don't have the correct rhythm. So start there and do it with both hands. Because if you can't pat the rhythm with like no notes, there's no way you're going to play the rhythm with the notes. <laughs> so, um, and then I would just recommend, yeah, like take small chunks, keep your eyes up on the music and be a stickler with yourself when you're doing this kind of practice. When you're performing, you just throw caution to the wind and you like, you know, <laughs> kiss worries goodbye and say whatever happens is what's meant to happen. When you're practicing, you want to get those note accuracy, accuracy 100% of the time. You want to get that rhythm accurate 100% of the time. And you need to use the same fingering 100% of the time. Otherwise, you're going to constantly be retraining your body to do something slightly different, which is why finger numbers are so helpful. Yes. So that feels like a crap ton of things to keep track of. So that's why you do really small chunks. If you're going to get hands together, maybe just make it a goal to get the first two beats of the first measure of the piece in tempo without looking at your hands with the dynamics you know with the articulations just layer the information patiently and go slowly and you'll be pretty impressed with the um, progress that you make yeah and the other thing i will say too if you're able to practice before you go to sleep 
the kind of connections that your brain makes before you um, or while you're sleeping, when you wake up the next morning, you'll be able to play the piece so much easier because you practiced right before you went to sleep. So um, I would recommend doing that as well. Awesome. I love it. Uh, okay. So do more advanced musicians eventually just do the counting subconsciously or is it they know the piece enough to kind of just wing it? Um, so I would say with rhythm for me personally, I'm never winging it because I can't, <laughs> um, I can't just wing it with rhythm. Maybe some people can, I won't speak for all musicians, but I can't do that. So I'm always counting on some level. And I think the level of engagement with counting can change. So whether I'm keeping a, a beat that's kind of loose with my foot because I'm, you know, playing a piece for the very first time and I'm just kind of trying to sight read it is one thing to versus whether I'm counting in my head and I'm really trying to focus on the rhythm and I'm counting in my head to where I'm actually counting out loud and really drilling the rhythm of something. Um, so I use all, all the different engagements and like levels of engagement with rhythm at different points in my practice. I would say I err on the side of counting out loud because it helps me stay grounded in the present moment and it helps me externalize the rhythm so that I can hear the rhythm and I can hear what I'm doing and I'm much more likely to know if I'm doing it correctly that way. So counting out loud is by far the best way to ensure that you are doing everything as it's supposed to be um, and then just engaging with with different levels of it. Yeah, my students do not love counting out loud when we first begin, Me <laughs> but everybody's glad they know how to do it once they can put it into practice. Yes, exactly. And that's what I would say. If you haven't been counting out loud, start now. It's never too late and really work on that skill. And you'll be so glad um, that you, you did that. Okay. Um, where can you get these flashcards? I will link them in the description below. Um, they're really awesome. I use them all the time. And then how do you balance practicing with a metronome and rubato? Should I use the metronome if I understand the rhythm? Um, yes, you should use the metronome if you understand the rhythm, because again, actually counting out loud and the metronome work best paired together. Um, with rubato, <laughs> this is going to come as maybe silly advice, but just ignore the metronome when you get to the rubato parts. <laughs> That's what I'll do is I'll turn on the metronome. And as soon as I get to a section, because ideally, if you're, if you're doing rubato in your piece, you know where that's happening. It's something that you kind of have planned out, you have an idea where it's happening. And so when you get to those sections, you ignore the metronome and you do your rubato. And then as soon as the rubato is over, you get back with the metronome. Mm -hmm. um, another great way to practice that is if you have a digital metronome to turn off the clicking sound of the metronome and to just allow the flashing light to be on, um, because then you can kind of look at the flashing light when you want to tune in and make sure you're with the metronome. And then you can look away from the flashing light when you're at your rubato section. And then you can look back to the flashing light when you get back to the ah tempo or the original tempo spot to check in and make sure that you're at the right tempo. Yeah. What do yeah. you think? No, I think that I just echo everything you said. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. And metronome. Yes. Metronome like rhythm is something, it's a skill that you have to learn mm -hmm. how to use the metronome. Yeah. Be patient with yourself. It is not intuitive mm -mm. like to 95% of people. No, the metronome has only existed for, you know, the last little bit of human history. Mm -hmm. yeah. The metronome didn't exist when Beethoven was writing his piano sonatas. So um, keep that in mind with the metronome. It's a great tool and we want to use it as a tool, but we don't, the goal is not to turn yourself into like a robotic metronome. That's not the goal. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, that was the last question there. We're getting all kinds of great feedback. Yes. Though. Thanks for chiming in, everybody. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Was there wow, Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got all the questions that were typed in on comments. So. Yeah. Do we have anything else we want to talk about? I mean. We got a few more minutes. Clean slate. Ask us anything. If not, I'll go. I'll, I'll get out my soapbox and I can talk more about the metronome but I don't think anyone else wants, to, I don't think you want to hear that. <laughs> I mean, I, I like the metronome. It's like, yeah. I like the metronome. Like I like the circle of fifths. It's just weird, but it's like, once you get it, yeah. you're grateful, you know it and you're happy to have it. But, um, a barrier to get to that point can be high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could also talk about, well, what is something that you still want to learn with music theory? Oh my gosh. I would love to know more about like complex harmony. And by that, I mean, so I studied a lot in school and growing up, my background is a lot in like Western classical music. So I studied a lot of Western classical harmony, but I didn't study different kinds of harmonies, different kinds of scales. I had one class that was music of the world. Um, I would love to learn more about 
uh, different tonal systems and structures from around the world. That would be awesome. I would love to be able to draw on all of that. Yes. I think that would be such a more um, like encompassing view of music. So that's on my to-do list. Me too. You? Me too. Yeah. Oh, there's so many things, but um, I would really like to learn um, compositionally just like how how to create more interesting harmonies when I'm writing music um, and how like the great improvisers, like all classical musicians are improvisers, but also I'm specifically, I'm thinking of um, like black American classical music and, or also known as jazz, how they take those key centers and scales and create something so interesting on the fly and um I that's just something I am super fascinated with and want to learn more about um and I just could really stand to improve in a lot of areas still in terms of understanding how composers put music together and everything um analyzing intricate harmonies and all of that so nice um it's a whole world out there <laughs> And the cool thing about music is that you never really get to the point where you know it all. I mean, I guess that's true of everything in life, but especially in music, like you can study music your whole entire life and not get to the point that you know everything, which is really cool. Um, how do you choose? <laughs> oh, these are great questions. How do you choose what key you'll play in when you write your own music? Um, you write more music than I do, so I'll let you start and then I'll answer. Okay. And then when you see a public piano, do you sit down and play? It depends on how many people are with me that are going to peer pressure me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends on the context, but oftentimes, uh, I not always, sometimes, half and half. How about you? Uh, what, when I see a piano? Yeah. I, uh, sometimes, yeah. I, I don't know if you've seen the pianos on the street, but they can be kind of sketch. Um, <laughs> so I had to play a whole hour on a piano that was missing ivories. So it was like playing on the wood and it, they were, the, the pedal was broken and a couple keys were broken. So the piano that I know I'm kind of determines how I sound. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing uh, sometimes. Yeah. And also like if there's a little kid playing and showing off, like I'm not going to go sit down and play. Or yeah. if there are other people enjoying the music, I'm not going to go sit down and play. If I'm with a friend and they're like, please, 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 will you play? Then maybe I will. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, how do you choose which key to write your own music in? It's a great question, Brant. Um, I don't really know. I think that it's twofold. One is like, what what keys do I like to like improvise in? Like, I really like the key of G minor. <gasps> Me too. Oh, really? Yes. That's oh. Like G minor and E flat major. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I love that key for some reason. So yeah. I really like to play in that. And then if I'm singing, um, I like to choose keys that I can sing in. Um, cause my, my vocal range is kind of narrow. So I have to choose keys that I can sing in and not have it be too high or too low. So, um, if it's a vocal piece, then that's a big one. Or I, I like having a couple black keys in there. Like it just helps like tactily how it feels when I'm playing. So when I'm writing a piece of music, I like to make sure there's at least a couple flats or sharps in there. So yeah. good question. Yeah, that's great. I can't believe we both like the key of G minor. We've never discovered that until now. There, we have so many weird similarities. <laughs> yes. But. Okay. Well, I think it's about time for us to do our giveaway. Woo! Yeah. So before this, I took all of the people. Well, for those of you that don't know, we did a giveaway um, with this live stream tonight. So we're giving away two three-month memberships to our monthly membership where you get access to our pre-recorded piano courses and to our private Facebook group. And you get our email address. So you can also ask questions and um, request feedback from us anytime that you want. And I have two people that won. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do to just, you know, protect people's an anonymity and all of that is I'm going to type the first five letters of your email address into the chat. So not your, I'm not going to give your whole email address, but just the first five letters. And you do need to be present to win. So if you can say like, Got, that's me or I'm here, then we'll go ahead and email you your free membership. And if I don't hear from you within like a minute or two, we might answer another question or two. And then I'm going to go ahead and draw someone else's name if you're not here. Um, so the first winner, uh, will you hold up please? Drum roll. <laughs> uh, first, Drum roll. I didn't see it. Uh, these are the first five letters of your email address and it's uh, Gabriella. You are one of the winners. So if you could please type in the chat and let us know that you're here, we will email you your nice. free membership. And then the next one is um, Ryan. And I just typed the first few letters of your email address in the chat. So Ryan, if you can let us know that you are here, then you can also get access to your free membership. Um, now, in the meantime, we probably have time for one more question. And in case they're not here, I'm going to go to the, my backup draws. So, and does anybody have um, another question? Or 
Can I ask you a question, Stephanie? Oh, sure. Okay. So what is your, Stephanie is, um, for those of you that don't know, Stephanie is an amazing improviser. Um, <laughs> I improvise. Uh, she's, she's, her music is very beautiful. And I'm really curious. Um, every time I hear you play, I've always been really curious, like what's going on in your mind when you're improvising? Are you thinking about music theory? Are you just like hearing what it sounds like? Like, what is that process like for you? Well, when I am improvising, I always come back to the harmonic structure, like the chords I'm playing. So if I'm playing over a, a song that I wrote or that is somebody else wrote, I like to think about the chords and then I like to think about the scales I can play over them. So a lot of it is music theory, but it's it, it starts to feel less like theory and more like art because mm. the more you kind of think about like C major is all white keys, all of a sudden you're painting with white keys. And, you know, if you're playing in the key of five sharps or whatever, all of a sudden you're painting with, you know, three white keys and five black keys or something like that. And um, I like to think about that. I also like to think about um, the chords and landing on like what the chord tones are. So if I have like four measures of E major, for instance, then I know that if I landed on the one, three, five, or seven of that chord, then it will sound like it makes sense. So that combined with the scale, if that makes sense, the scale and then landing on a chord tone of that chord, I can start to create things that have meaning. And kind of tying back to what you were talking about ear training and the importance of ear training, if I know what it sounds like to, you know, create a perfect fifth sound, and I'm trying to create a more open sound in my improvising, then I will pull upon playing a perfect fifth in the key that I'm in. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, totally. So that totally I'm pulling sense. on music theory concepts, absolutely. But when you're in the moment, it starts to feel a little bit more like you're painting with pastels mm -hmm. um, or different colors rather than, um, you know, keys. But but if I don't know the keys, then I don't have, if you don't have the vocabulary, then it, I mean, yeah. it, so knowing your theory is really helpful. So, um, but I, I really have so far to go with my improvising still um, in terms of hearing what I'm playing and then playing what I hear. That's something that I'm really working on right now. So nice. I have to say again, training your ear is yeah. very, very important. Okay, awesome. Thank you for sharing. Do we have a runner up? Um, we do. So um, Elliot, and I put the first few, um, few letters of your email address there and then awesome it looks like tac mac one yeah cool so we have your email address so we're going to email you all of the info that you need to get started okay. um that's awesome i'm so happy that you're here to get it that's yes. exciting yes. and if that other person is not here then you know what i'm just going to go back to the next backup and i'm going to say um one second i'm going to get the first few oh well the first few letters of your email address are your first name um I'm going to call you, oh, this is exciting. You know who you are because this is what I call you in class. Um, Melissa M., uh, you are the other winner of the membership. So yay, yay. congratulations. This is exciting. Super fun. So we will be in touch. We'll email you all the information that you need to get started. Yeah. And then we look forward to connecting with you again. Um, thanks so much for showing up and for being here. It was awesome to get to know your questions and some of your struggles and strengths with music theory. Um, and just stay tuned for the next live and for, for the next videos. Awesome. Have a great night, everybody. Yep. Happy practicing. Happy Bye. practicing. See you all later. Bye.